Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be getting started on my review of The Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula K. Le Guin. So as always, I'm going to read out the blurb, and then I'm going to start going through some of my tabs and sharing some of the highlights for me, and then I'll give it an overall, you know, thoughts and uh, rating at the end. So, blurb. Jen Lee I, I don't even know how to say his name, is an, he is an ethnologist observing the people of the winter world, Gethen. The people there are androgynous, nominally neuter, but they can become male or female at the peak of their sexual cycle. He becomes drawn into the complex politics of the planet and, during a long tortuous journey across the ice with a disgraced outcast politician, loses his professional detachment and reaches a painful understanding of the true nature of Gethenians and, in a moving and memorable sequence, even finds love. So, the introduction to this is written by uh, China Mayville and uh, I wanted to read this little bit out. In its problematizing of gender, The Left Hand of Darkness has been incomparably influential, a keystone of feminist fiction. Which is not to suggest that it is only about gender. It's a poised and sensitive love story of social control, understanding and misunderstanding, faithfulness and betrayal. It deals, slightly, with race. Not for the first time Le Guin's protagonist is of colour. It's a book of snow and ice, a melancholy cry of filia, all the more poignant now in a world heating up as we mourn the ongoing death of cold. It's a book about communication and its potential, alive though Le Guin is to its failures and manipulations. There is in the beautiful conceit of the Ansible, a device allowing instantaneous communication across impossible distances, a utopian kernel. In all these themes and others, it is never not about gender too. All its aspects, in Le Guin's words, are involved with its sex-gender aspects quite, instric quite inextricably. Because in these pages, kings become pregnant. And uh, so there's an introduction by Ursula Le Guin as well here, I want to read out part of this. Uh, on the nature of science fiction. Science fiction is often described and even defined as extrapolative. The science fiction writer is supposed to take a trend or phenomenon of the here and now, purify it and intensify it for dramatic effect, and extend it into the future. If this goes on, this is what will happen. A prediction is made. Method and results much resemble those of a scientist who feeds large doses of a purified and concentrated food additive to mice in order to predict what may happen to people who eat it in small quantities for a long time. The outcome seems almost inevitably to be cancer. So does the outcome of extrapolation. Strictly extrapolative works of science fiction generally arrive about where the Club of Rome arrives, somewhere between the gradual extinction of human liberty and the total extinction of terrestrial life. This may explain why many people who do not read science fiction describe it as escapist, but when questioned further, admit they do not read it because it's so depressing. Almost anything carried to its logical extreme becomes depressing, if not carcinogenic. I thought this was interesting. Predictions are uttered by prophets free of charge, by clairvoyants, who usually charge a fee and are therefore more honoured in their day than prophets, and by futurologists, salaried. Prediction is the business of prophets, clairvoyants and futurologists. It is not the business of novelists. A novelist business is lying. Okay, so let's get started then with The Left Hand of Darkness. So I thought this was quite an interesting just opening paragraph. I'll make my report as if I told a story, for I was taught as a child on my homeworld that truth is a matter of the imagination. The soundest fact may fail or prevail in the style of its telling, like that singular organic jewel of our seas which grows brighter as one woman wears it and, worn by another, dulls and goes to dust. Facts are no more solid, coherent, round and real than pearls are, but both are sensitive. We have a, a reference to someone driving an electric car which I thought was quite cool considering it was first published in 1969. I just thought this was a nice little bit of world building. After supper, by the fire, we drank hot beer. On a world where a common table implement is a little device with which you crack the ice that has formed on your drink between drafts, hot beer is a thing you come to appreciate. This is interesting as well, another reference to sort of sex and sexuality. Even in a bisexual society, the politician is very often something less than an integral man. I thought this was cool, uh, something that they said that they say in ecumenical school. When action grows unprofitable, gather information. When information grows unprofitable, sleep. I like this little quote. I thought, shivering, that there are things that outweigh comfort, unless one is an old woman or a cat. An interesting little paragraph here. Um, Goss used the pronoun that designates a male animal, not the pronoun for a human being in the masculine role of Kemmer. He looked a little embarrassed. Car riders discuss sexual matters freely and talk about Kemmer with both reverence and gusto, but they are reticent about discussing perversion. At least, they were with me. Excessive prolongation of the Kemmer period, with permanent hormonal imbalance toward the male or the female, causes what they call perversion. It is not rare, 3 or 4% of adults may be physiological perverts or abnormals, normals by our standard. They are not excluded from society, but they are tolerated with some disdain, as homosexuals are in many bisexual societies. 
The Kurdish slang for them is half deads. They are sterile. Uh, they they have uh, something called mind speech, uh, communication, voluntary sent and received. And someone says, then why not speak aloud? Well, one can lie speaking. Not mind speaking. Not intentionally. And uh, also they can sort of, again, we've talked about foretelling, foretelling the future. And there is this little exchange here. You don't see yet, Jenry, why we perfected and practiced foretelling. No. To exhibit the perfect uselessness of knowing the answer to the wrong question. Deep. But one of them, the next to last one, ran away. Haharath he was called. Far he ran over the plain of ice and over the lands of earth. Edondorath ran behind him and caught up with him at last and smote him. Haharath died. Then Edondorath returned to the birthplace on the Gobberin ice where the bodies of the others lay, but the last one was gone. He had escaped while Edondorath pursued Haharath. Edondorath built a house of the frozen bodies of his brothers and waited there inside that house for that last one to come back. Each day one of the corpses would speak saying, does he burn? Does he burn? All the other corpses would say with frozen tongues, no, no. Then Edondorath entered Kemmer as he slept and moved and spoke aloud in dreams. And when he woke, the corpses were all saying, he burns, he burns. And the last brother, the youngest one, heard them saying that and came into the house of bodies and there coupled with Edondorath. Of these two were the nations of men born out of the flesh of Edondorath, out of Edondorath's womb. The name of the other, the younger brother, the father, his name is not known. Each of the children born to them had a piece of darkness that followed him about wherever he went by daylight. Edondorath said, Why are my sons followed thus by darkness? His kemmering said, Because they were born in the house of flesh, therefore death follows at their heels. They are in the middle of time. In the beginning there was the sun and the ice, and there was no shadow. In the end, when we are done, the sun will devour itself, and shadow will eat light, and there will be nothing left but the ice and the darkness. So uh, I thought this was interesting whether we're talking about mind speech again. We tried mind speech again. I had never before sent repeatedly to a total non-receiver. The experience was disagreeable. I began to feel like an atheist praying. Some good bits here to read out. Uh, There's nothing wrong with me, I went on, except acute chronic fear. I know the feeling. Fear is very useful, like darkness, like shadows. Uh, and then we get this bit here. He had just noted down our day's journey and done some calculation of mileage and rations. He pushed the little tablet and carbon pencil around the chabe stove to me. On the blank leaf glued to the inner back cover, I drew the double curve within the circle and blacked the yin half of the single, then pushed it back to my companion. Do you know that sign? He looked at it a long time with a strange look, but he said, no. It's found on earth and on Hein Devonan and on Chifawa. It is yin and yang. Light is the left hand of darkness. How did it go? Light, dark, fear, courage, cold, warmth, female, male. It is yourself, Theram. Both and one. A shadow on snow. And I just thought that was cool because of this cover. I always love it when the cover artist has clearly read the book, you know. I thought this was interesting. And this final thing I want to read out. This is kind of relevant to the world we live in today. I wondered, not for the first time, what patriotism is. What the love of country truly consists of. How that yearning loyalty that had shaken my friend's voice arises. And how so real a love can become, too often, so foolish and vile a bigotry. Where does it go wrong? So all in all, yeah, I did really enjoy The Left Hand of Darkness. I thought it was great how it kind of mixes fantasy and sci-fi in a way. Well, I particularly was impressed by the way that it explores the, these themes of gender and sexuality whilst being a fantasy slash sci-fi hybrid, whilst also just having a generally interesting storyline, you know? So even when you're reading the backstory, like that chapter about that, um, that origin legend, that was interesting, you know? The whole thing was pretty damn good. So I gave it a 4.25 out of 5 and would recommend. So there we have it. That's what I made of The Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula K. Le Guin. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.